But I'm excited to tell you about the efforts in my laboratory to bring in the super resolution uh, techniques directly inside the immune cells to look at how transcription occurs. In terms of distance scales, uh, we have to start from the human scale and zoom in first a million fold, and that brings us inside the cell to an area around the cell nucleus. The picture becomes very blurry very quickly because we're trying to image now at the very limit of optical microscopy. So the techniques that my lab would adopt and further develop for our specific purposes would be the single molecule based super resolution techniques that break the optical uh, diffraction limits to reveal in finer detail the organization of the higher molecules within. In particular, we'll care about some of these clusters. You can take some of the largest ones, zoom in an order of order of magnitude. And now the scale bar is the one wavelength of visible light, and at this scale we can see not just individual molecules, which are some of the DMS spots, but also when the molecules come together to form these clusters. The molecule of interest is uh, RNA polymerase 2. It's the molecular complex responsible for the synthesis of all messenger RNA. And we were joking in the summer school with the students that, uh, in fact, if you Google transcription, Google will tell you that transcription is a well understood process. And uh, you would even get cartoons like this that tell you exactly how transcription happens inside the living cell. So, for example, the polymerase may not have. Um, a specific gain of recognition domain, so it's assisted by a general factor. Once that's bound, then you'll see the polymerase coming out in blue or green that would bind alongside dozens of other cofactors that in this cartoon will just magically fly in from the right. So once you form the appreciation complex, then a distal region, the enhancers believe to zoom in and laser focus know directly where to touch the polymerase. And once that happens, it would release the polymerase, which can then track like a train on the railroad, unwinding this double helix to reveal the uh, genetic code ATGCs, which copies one strand into an iron copy. Now, however elaborate this cartoon may seem, it's still just uh, right, a cartoon. It's too simplistic and perhaps even wrong. The reality is that there is no method of microscopy that would allow you to uncover such dynamic processes with sufficient detail. And the problem has to do with uh, what we mean in the field when we say we're looking at single biomolecules. Represented here, for instance, is the green fluorescent protein. The molecule itself may have a Stokes radius of 1 to 2 nanometer, but of course, what we're looking at is light emitted from that molecule. Light being a wave, it will diffract at the same uh, you know, order as uh, the wavelength. So what you get is this big blob that is two orders of magnitude bigger than the actual size of the molecule. So if you want to clearly separate multiple molecules, they better be separated by more than the wavelength of light, or more than 100 times their actual size. But luckily, the opposite is also true. That is, if you can separate your localization in, in time, you certainly can localize the center with nanometer accuracy. And that's the principle behind single molecule-based uh, so-called super resolution techniques that use the fact that you can turn molecules in and off to reconstruct a picture here that is much sharper than what conventional microscopes can resolve at the top. These techniques, of course, go by many acronyms. You've probably heard of photoactivation, localization, microscopy, polymer, stochastic optical, reconstruction microscopy. And for the purpose of this talk, we'll just assume they work under the same general principle. So in the next slide, I will try to summarize what we learned early on um, so that we can move to some of the more recent um, lessons that we learned from these studies. So we can do super resolution in a living cell to reveal that both of forms these clusters. And then we can take one of these uh, clusters and uh, we develop a time correlated uh, super resolution analysis called TC Palm, whereby if we take one of these loci and plot the number of detection that you get per frame, when there is no cluster over time, you get virtually no detection. When a cluster does occur, you get a high frequency of detection. And when a cluster is assembled, you get again no detection. And this is just the same information representing a cumulant form. So now the slope will tell you the density of detection. When there is no cluster, you get this kind of plateau. And when a cluster does occur, you get a high frequency of detection. And then you go back to a plateau upon this assembly. This allows you then to estimate the cluster lifetime. And we can do that, and we get an average cluster lifetime of about eight seconds. So we noted, especially for students, that eight seconds was actually very short lived, right? A typical polymerase elongation rate is about 2.5 kilobase pairs per minute. And a typical mammalian gene size being about 10,000 base pairs, it should take several minutes to finish even one messenger RNA. Whereas here we're talking about dynamics that are orders of magnitude faster. 
But in fact, what we've learned uh, progressively is that it's probably because of the transcription activity actually that this is uh, so dynamic. So if we use a drug, for example, DRD, that blocks a kinase that was probably the C terminal domain that we've heard about uh, from uh, um, Phil Stock, then now a cluster that will normally disassemble in eight seconds by blocking this kinase activity, blocking the transcription process, now the cluster seems to be very persistent, lasting a long time. So we know already that it seems functional in the sense that if you block the transcription activity, you actually change the dynamics of this cluster. So we push further to do dual color super resolution now, so that in one color we can see the gene locus with the nascent messenger RNA coming out in magenta, and then in green you would see the polymerase clustering and the recapture cluster happening exactly at the gene locus, so magenta on Green it would give you white, suggesting the question that exactly at the gene locus. And now with the dynamic uh, measurement, we can correlate how long the cluster was on the gene versus how many messenger RNA comes out. And what we seem to get is this linear correlation suggesting that although the cluster lasts just a few seconds, the longer the cluster is there, proportionately more messenger RNA comes out. So what we thought, uh, what we think is going on, we think that uh, this uh, textbook model that a single polymerase is diffusing around and may ultimately find a transcription start site to initiate and start to then elongate, it could still be go going on, but it's probably too inefficient, especially for genes that will respond up on an external signal almost immediately. We think for those genes, they can utilize the transient clustering of the polymerase during initiation simply to increase the local uh, concentration and facilitate the loading of the uh, polymerase. What our data suggests is that once the cluster is there, every two seconds, one polymerase is loaded. And the two seconds is also quite informative because, again, 2.5 kilobases per minute in the elongation rate. That's about 40 nucleotides per second. And uh, two seconds is about 80 nucleotides, which is the bubble size of the initiating polymerase as measured by uh, Steve Block and uh, Roger Kornberg. So we think when a cluster happens in station, polymerase are probably being loaded at the maximum efficiency, but the cluster lasts on average just about eight seconds, and that's enough time to load about four polymerases, which will give you four messenger RNA, the basal output for this gene. You stimulate the gene, you want to get more messenger RNA, so it's the way the cell will do that is to hold the cluster n times longer, given the opportunity to load n times more polymerase, which proportionately gives you n times more messenger. So the simple picture explains everything that we've seen in this uh, study from why it, it colloquializes, why we would get this kind of linear correlation. The longer the cluster is there, proportionately more RNA comes out. So moving forward then, we thought we'd been too narrowly focused on what happens with the polymerase recruitment at the promoter region. We said, as I mentioned, there's a distal region, the enhancer, that recruits its own set of factors, and chief among them is this mediator complex that is lead to directly coming in contact with uh, this polymerase. Uh, the best recent studies of the uh, mediator really have come from genome-wide approaches like CHIP-seq, where they say you will fix the cell, jump off the DNA, pull down the mediator, and then sequence everywhere where the uh, mediator was found. And what did this CHIP-seq data suggested was that for many key genes, it's not just a single enhancer binding site, but a tandem repeat of uh, enhancer binding site. <laughs> students are laughing because this is a repeat of what happens. So um, these are so-called the super enhancers. And as we heard a couple of years ago, it's okay. as, we, as we heard a couple of years ago, um, my senior colleagues, uh, Rick Young, uh, Arup Chakraborty, and Phil Sharp, uh, suggested in this leading edge uh, perspective that maybe it's not just multiple binding sites, but just multiple binding sites can help to nucleate real physical clusters of uh, polymerase and other cofactors. Um, they hypothesize also through you know, incredible intuition about how the super enhancers uh, must work and how they respond to known uh, drug treatments that maybe that the physical clusters that would be formed would have properties of so-called phase-separated condensate, which most people understand as uh, basically liquid-like droplets. But at the time, 
you know, it, it was quite debated because at the time, again, like the how mediator organizers in, in vivo was not known. The biophysical pro properties of uh, mediator clusters, if they exist, whether they're consistent with uh, phase separated condensate, also was not known. In fact, to our knowledge, even how polymerase and mediator associated inside living cell was, had not yet been seen. So we thought this was something that we could uh, try to address, if at all possible. So we moved to now stem cells, and uh, in the living stem cells, we've labeled the endogenous mediator and did the same type of super resolution that we've done before. Stem cells like to grow close together, so in a single field of view, you see multiple nuclei, and you can clearly see that stem cell in the stem cells, the mediator forms these clusters, so in addition to the clusters that look like what we'd seen before, you also see these very large clusters in stem cells. When you do TC palm, you see again that most of the clusters are highly dynamic like what we've seen before. In fact, 90% have an average cluster lifetime of about 11 seconds, but uh, you know, a small percentage, about 10%, would now have this persistent lifetime. Over the course of our imaging, you still continue to get uh, detection, suggesting the presence of the of the cluster there. Now, with the identification of these uh, of these persistent clusters, and this was uh, things that uh, we really found out when we were teaching the physiology summer course. So the students there called these persistent clusters super clusters, and I asked them why, and they told me that uh, after the summer course, they wanted us to continue working on it, and if they don't add the term super, we're not going to do that, right? So we work on super resolution, super enhancer, so they wanted to call it super clusters. But in fact, the fact that you get such persistent cluster was a great thing because then we may not need you know, such high resolution, super resolution microscopy, and we can use other approaches to look at other physical processes. So in particular, one of the um, trainees, uh, Jan Hendrik Spiele, you know, suggested that maybe we should build a lattice light sheet which will be a, a three-dimensional imaging object and we can still see these large ob objects. So now we can do longer term imaging and with, uh, thank you, we can do longer term <laughs> imaging and with uh, now this uh, super clusters diffusing at the same rate as chromatin, but if we do 30 minutes to an hour imaging, it's okay. If we do 30 minutes to an hour long imaging, we can, um, we may maybe see two clusters as they come together, what, what should happen if they're droplets like. Okay, students, you're used to this by now. They should fuse, right? So this is what we're going to show you. This is a longer term imaging, it's accelerated, and you're seeing two superclusters diffusing around, and when they come together, the movie will repeat, they in fact fuse into one. And this is again a 3D imaging, so we know that it's not just one cluster goes under the other, right? Um, we can see in both XY and in XZ that the two in fact fuse in all dimension. In fact, we can track the intensities of the different uh, clusters, so for example, the one in blue and the one in orange. In gray, I'm just summing up uh, the two intensities, and as you track their intensities, when they fuse, they in fact go to the sum of the two intensities, suggesting that they've in fact really merged their content. So we know that the uh, mediator forms these clusters, um, and then uh, polymerase also forms these clusters. So we've gone to do, um, you know, uh, this uh, trainee, Wang Ki Cho, did uh, this dual label cell line where endogenous mediator is labeled and endogenous polymerase is labeled. You can already see that for the same cell, whenever you see this large accumulation, of mediator, you also see the large accumulation of polymerases. So we can confirm that by the light cell super resolution that in fact inside the super clusters you get both mediator and fault too. I'm not going to go into much detail, but uh, through different drug experiments, now we're learning quite a bit about it. We know that if we block chromatin association, we can get rid of all clusters, and we know that if we selectively block the phosphorylation of the polymerase, we can purge out the polymerase out of these clusters while keeping the mediator cluster there. And we learned that, uh, you know, in Phil's talk, that through a work that is soon to come out, led by uh, Rick Young's lab, uh, that will come out in Nature, that uh, in fact the phosphorylation event could lead to the, you know, purging out of this mediator condensate and into splicing condensates. So there's a lot that we're learning about it, but there was a few things that I wanted to present for this, uh, uh, for the students and the audience especially. So, one of the things that I thought already at the time was uh, getting to be quite good is uh, 
at least in fixed cell, people could do uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization on DNA to look at where the enhancer is located and look at where the promoter is located. And according to the textbook model, these things should really be touching each other within a single molecule space, right? But what people are seeing is that there is this kind of, uh, you know, couple hundred nanometer gap between them. Well, what we posit is that, well, if there is in fact a cluster that is persistent in between them, then the DNA itself does not need to touch, but maybe the cluster that forms that the enhancer can just touch the promoter and that's sufficient. So we wanted to test that, right? I think we could explain this kind of spooky action uh, at a distance with a hundreds of nanometer gap. But in fact, if this picture is more dynamic even, you can get things that one moment is microns away and then the next moment they could be kissing. So we really wanted to test this uh, directly. So we went and picked one of the top super enhancer control genes and labeled uh, the nascent RNA coming out of this gene uh, ESRB. So now in a dual color super, uh, in a dual color lattice type of <coughs> gene, we can see, for example, the ESRB uh, nascent RNA in magenta, the mediator protein in green, and uh, I will just show you now a focus around the gene locus and now I will show you the movie quickly. That you will see, for example, let's say if you fix the cell at this locus, right? You can see the gene is over here and the nearest mediator uh, cluster is over here. It's a micron away. You will never associate these two together. But if you waited just a minute later, they're perfectly co-localizing, right? In fact, it looks like uh, these things are apart. They kiss, they stay together for a while and then they go back apart again. So if you now look at this movie, in green will be the mediator in magenta, the gene locus, and I apologize, these lights are washing out the screen, but when they come together, you see a white that is the colocalization between those two. So you really get this dynamic kissing interaction between uh, the condensates. So with the few minutes that I have left, uh, there is another implication that I wanted to talk to the students about, and which, which is this idea that you know we're physicists, and if we use words like uh, condensates and phases, it really means something you know very specific in uh, at least uh, equilibrium thermodynamics, right? So condensation, for for example, is something that uh, we all have experience with. Right? Like I like to take. Uh, you know, hot showers, and uh, so in the hot showers, what would happen, right? You turn on the, um, the hot shower, the steam supersaturate the air, and the supersaturated air start to condense, and through many different complex reasons, it's a lot easier to see it on a uh, mirror, and you can even do all types of things like that. Have students done this before? <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. So, you know, we understand quite a bit about at least the condensation of water alone, and it seems to happen through a so-called first-order phase transition. And what most people understand by that is somehow if you can extract the free energy that are uh, involved, you would get this kind of uh, nucleation barrier. If you plot the free energy versus the cluster size, there's a nucleation barrier. Below this, things will spontaneously disassemble, but above this, uh, uh, the system can minimize the energy by spontaneously growing the cluster. So I want to take a slide uh, to go back through uh, what some of you may know through solid state physics or uh, condensed matter and try to figure out, uh, you know, get some intuition about what may be going on, at least from the equilibrium physics, and see how relevant is that really to what could be going on inside the living cell. So those in solid state physics may recall that uh, the energy associated uh, with the condensation process looks something like this with two terms, this weird dependence you know, on the cluster size to the two-third and this uh, cluster size to the first power. And if you don't remember, I would like to give some intuition of where this may come from. So imagine you're trying to form a cluster of radius r, and you're thinking about the energy that you would need to form this cluster. So you can divide the molecules in two species. The molecules that are first on the surface, they may as likely leave your cluster as they are to stay inside your cluster. You would need a positive energy term, right? And that energy will scale with the surface, so R squared. Whereas the second group of molecules that are buried inside through many different considerations, maybe they like to be inside the cluster, maybe they don't like to be inside a cluster. So you may need a positive energy or a negative energy. Right? And that term will depend on the volume, and the volume will be R cubed. Well, when you're forming a, a, a condensate, you're forming a new phase that has a constant density. So the number of molecules that you get will scale with the volume of that cluster. 
So n scaling like r cubed, so that means that r is like n to the one third, you plug it in here, you get the a n to the two thirds, you plug it here, you get n to the first power. Is that okay? Okay. So to dive more for people that remember their physical chemistry, right? Like this first term is nothing more than the free energy associated with the surface. It's a surface tension times the area of the cluster. And the second term is quite interesting. It depends on the natural log of the concentration of monomers in your ambient solution, divided by a preferred saturation concentration that emerges in your system. Those of you who would remember your know, physical, perhaps now we're at physical chemistry too, right, would know that this term is nothing more than the change in the chemical potential of your system. But all you need to know really is that something special happens when uh, C is at C saturation. So if C is equal to C saturation, then this ratio gives you how much? C over C saturation is how much? One. one. What is natural log of one? Zero. So this term vanishes altogether at C saturation. And you can go back and check. If C is above C saturation, natural log of something greater than one is greater than zero. With this negative sign, this term becomes negative. If C is less than C saturation, natural log of something less than one right, is negative. So with this negative sign, you get a positive term. So in fact, in a super saturated case, what happens is C is greater than C saturation. This second term becomes negative. So you have a balance between a positive term that dominates at small n and a negative term that dominates at the large term. And this compensation between a surface and a bulk term gives rise to this uh, maximal uh, free energy, right? this free energy barrier above which things can be stable. Are we okay? So to what extent will this really be applicable inside a living cell? You, you can ask, well, to do that, you really have to be able to see these pre-nucleated uh, clusters. And uh, for that, you have to get enough resolution to resolve uh, this part. And we think that for transcription, for many of the reasons that we heard before, transcription is too highly regulated for us to just see this pure physics. So we went to look somewhere else in misfolded protein aggregation. And these are misfolded protein aggregates that are labeled with uh, alpha synuclein, which would become a problem if it goes unchecked in Parkinson's disease. And there, with this uh, high-resolution microscopy, you can already see these precursor clusters, and they seem uh, to coalesce, like we've seen, for example, in the polymerase. This movie will look back around. It's showing a three-way merger. You'll see these first two merge into one, and the third one merge. So if you look at here, you start with the three intensities, the purple and the orange merge. They go to the sum of their intensities, and then this one merge with the first cluster, and they go to the sum of the intensities. For things that I don't have time to talk about today, I will point to the students. Consistently, what you'll see is that when we go to such high intensities, something else kicks in. It's like the cell does not want really large cluster and it relaxes back. And I'm not going to talk about this today, and it will probably keep us busy for many years. But let's talk about this. So the first thing we can do is look at uh, the clusters that we're seeing, but for example, by superposition, and you can check that the number of detection really scales with R cubed, the radius cube. And if that is true, then for the pre-nucleated clusters, it's just clusters that are trying to climb over a nucleation barrier. So it's especially harder and harder for them to get to that top, the top of that barrier. The distribution is nothing more than a Boltzmann distribution, an exponential distribution. So rather than plotting the distribution of the cluster size, you can plot minus log of the distribution of the cluster size to try to see what a free energy will look like. So you can take just minus log of that distribution plot it in log log plot, and look at small cluster sizes, and we see this asymptotic limit, right, of the two-thirds that, that creeps in, okay? So you can say, okay, let's accept that for small clusters they're limited by the surface tension, and then let's subtract it from the rest of our distribution data. So, you know, most of us have done this where we fit it, uh, uh, you know, we've taken data, we've fit in a curve, and we subtract a curve from the data, and the residual gets quite noisy, right? So when you do that theoretically, you take uh, a n to the two-thirds, subtract it from your distribution, and this is my last slide, subtract it from the distribution, what should be really left is minus b n, and minus b n is the equation of a line of negative slope. So I expected the residual that we would get would be something that it's kind of linear, but it will be curvy, and I would argue that, okay, it's roughly what we would expect in physics. 
But when Arjun did this, this is what he showed me. It's strikingly linear. Right? What this would mean is that there might be other processes at play inside this living cell. But the dominant process is the simple physical mechanism, likely the simple physical mechanism that you can just draw from equilibrium physics. So that allows us then to get both terms. We can then extract for the first time what the critical cluster size is, it's 160 nanometer, and what the nucleation barrier is, it's about 7 kBT, which is small enough that uh, it could happen through a purely thermally driven process. You don't need an ATP hydrolysis, but it's large enough also to create an equilibrium uh, of uh, concentration ratio that is a thousand fold, which is what we suspect is happening between the condensate and the ambient uh, things. So I'll finish by thanking uh, really the people that did the work. The super resolution uh, and the lightest light sheet were done respectively by Wonky Cho and uh, Jan Hendrik Spiele, both of whom have moved on to become assistant professors now. The last part about the uh, classical nucleation theory was really led by Arjun Narayanan, who's also uh, left to go do his independent fellowship. Uh, these works were done in collaboration with uh, many different people, the MBL physiology class, uh, the people at uh, Janilia, Luke Lavis, Timioli, Brian English, Rick Young, Phil Sharp, and Aru Chakaborty, and uh, their, their trainees as well. And uh, I, I, as I told the students, I was very fortunate to have had uh, TJ Haas, my mentor, and uh, backed by the support of this uh, National Science Foundation Physics Frontier Center, uh, where some of these ideas really originated um, in terms of looking at uh, weak and transient interaction at the single molecule level. And I also uh, acknowledge uh, the other funding agencies, and uh, we're always looking for talented uh, students to join the lab. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting stuff that you told us. Well, uh, let me ask you a question. What fraction of the pole 2 on the in vivo will, will form this condensate? That's one. Mm -hmm. And two, we didn't, I, I mean, maybe you addressed that, I, but I didn't quite figure out if these condensates at some point disassembled. Yeah. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in fact, most of the, most of the cluster, like over 90% of cluster, even in stem cell, are you know, rapidly assembly and disassembly. Their lifetime is just a few seconds. Right? Now, even inside those very uh, large and uh, you know, sustaining clusters, the polymerase, the neutral polymerases last just about 10 seconds. If we do, uh, we can see this by frap. So in reality, at any given time, only a small fraction of the polymerases are actually inside uh, this, this cluster. And I think that should uh, uh, come back to one of the earlier discussion also. These things are dynamically happening, but they're also rapidly exchanging. 5%, 10%? Numbers, so, right? so actually for that, I will point to one of the earlier studies by um, um, the group of, um, of Sunny G that did actually a characterization and a careful counting of how many polymerases are in a cluster versus how many polymerases are you know, not in clustered in a fixed cell. And they actually found out that uh, something like 97 to 99% of polymerases are just freely available. Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, probably that's closer to the, to the truth now. And now we can start to understand why. Okay, one more. So a short question. Beautiful physics, but let's go back to the kissing. What is drilling the kissing? What is really in the kissing? What is drilling the kissing? What is driving and, the kissing? And, uh, and uh, going back, I'm coming from the cytosol after uh, all very pneumonia in the nucleus. If, if you compare this to the endosome on maturation and uh, stuff like that, kiss and run theory is always driven by a specific proteins that are actually involved in, in, in the affinity of, of this process. Yeah. And in here, what's your command? What is driving this? Look, I can only speculate, right? I can, uh, after uh, seeing uh, Eris' uh, talk at the uh, 
you know, at the summer school, I would be excited to know, for example, if cohesin is involved, whether this uh, loop extrusion can help drive these processes. <laughs> what I will say, though, is that um, you know, there was a work by Ioana Wasuka's lab that uh, labeled uh, uh, an enhancer for an active gene in the stem cell. And what they found was that diffusion was faster, as if there was some thermalization process when transcription is active. So there can be a lot of uh, you know, competing effect to actually drive uh, the frequency of these interactions. And, and I would say, right, uh, uh, it's an exciting thing for students uh, to, to pursue here. <laughs> Yeah. You said you didn't want to discuss it, but I'll ask anyway. <laughs> what is driving the breakdown of clusters above the nucleation size? Yeah. So, yeah, so in, in the case where we could see classical nucleation uh, theory, then there is really only one way that was posited by Leo Ziller, that there must be some weird uh, Maxwell demon that, is, that may be sensing somehow that the cluster has reached a critical size. You know, and then start to, to disassemble that. Well, we don't quite understand how that is happening, but what we were able to do is go back, and at least in the case of uh, synphalin-based aggregate, there's a lot of background studies that were done on this, uh, you know, the, on the later uh, inclusions that happened. So we can look at this kind of data and then try to narrow down what could be playing this disaggregate's role. And so we've identified at least one protein, RAFBL, that when we knock it down, you now do not get any more this maintenance of the things in a supersaturated state. So at least in one case, we know, we know one protein that seems to be involved in some mechanism, perhaps a disaggregation mechanism, that is preferential to the supercritical clusters. And you know, we suspect that other non-equilibrium phenomena could be at play. And, and we certainly are thinking hard and, you know, we welcome other input on how to think about it as well. All right. Uh, if there are any, questions, any further questions, we'll save it for Thursday. But for now, thank you for having